I'm Michael Whitfield. I'm the uh, director of the Heart of the Rockies Initiative for another month. My replacement's right back there. Um, we're showing a film on the High Divide. The High Divide Collaborative is, is a, a partnership of, of a wide variety of folks in southwest Montana, eastern Idaho, and uh, Heart of the Rockies uh, helps to convene this group. Uh, we commissioned this film to tell the story of the High Divide and the voices of the the stakeholders, the people that live and work and play in this landscape, and uh, give credit to Eric Bendick, uh, son of our own Bob Bendick here, who, with Grizzly Creek Films out of Bozeman, that produced this film. <laughs> so the High Divide Collaborative engages a lot of people in, a, in an amazing landscape, and you're going to hear some of these voices. It's a broad array of folks, stakeholders from all sectors, uh, that address uh, a lot of common issues. We started out recognizing uh, a landscape with continentally significant connectivity for, for fish and wildlife, headwaters along the continental divide, and quickly realized, as we've been in our discussions today, that we, we needed to think not just about that ecological treasure, but the social and cultural values in the landscape. And so we brought a great group of people around this landscape. This is the high divide. It connects Yellowstone to the central Idaho wilderness and, and then the crown of the continent to the north. So an amazing landscape, uh, rich in, in ecological and cultural resources. Uh, we quickly expanded our vision uh, to include eight conservation goals. These are shared goals that all these stakeholders have come together to articulate and share. So we have that shared vision and now we're working collectively to, to realize the vision as we, we find ways to add value for uh, a whole array of uh, local conservation initiatives that roll their community-based conservation up to landscape scale. That's the whole premise of our work is we believe that durable conservation in this landscape arises from that community base and rolls up to, to landscape. And I wanted to just give you a little bit of context for, for where we work. So. This landscape has been called the Big Empty sometimes. It's a rural place with not a lot of pop, uh, people. It's a big open country, but it's changing pretty fast. And these are projections from Headwaters Economics, uh, economic group out of Bozeman that gives us great data and uh, really tells a story of, of what's facing us. This is an even more alarming projection for out to 2065. This is work from Todd Wilkinson, Mountain Journal, predicting that if Bozeman continues to grow at 3% rate, it would be Minneapolis at that time. Uh, Jackson Hole and the area around where I live, four generations on that landscape, would be Salt Lake City. And so we can see the impacts that are coming to this rural landscape. This is where all these folks recreate and, and play. Uh, and that's 4% or 3% growth. The actual growth in Bozeman right now is almost 5%. So uh, we, we face threats. But here's the story of the High Divide and the voices of High Divide folks. And then we'll welcome our panel and, and rock and roll. Representatives of the High Divide Collaborative, they come up to the table and we'll have a little conversation. We have two of our movie stars here. Two of the others have retired, and one moved on to another job. So we have uh, some surrogates, but five great representatives. And we wanted to characterize the diversity of stakeholders that we have in the landscape. This is a place where it's, it's not top-down uh, agency directed. It's not bottom-up landowner directed. It's stakeholder directed, all players at the table. So let me introduce our panel. Uh, we have Yvette Converse, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, coordinator for the Great Northern Landscape Cooperative. Yvonne Martinell, a rancher uh, from Del Montana, uh, Centennial Valley Association, uh, very involved as a local community leader, really interested. She was on the Hill all day today making the case with her congressional delegation for support for our rural schools and the like. We have Merrill Beeler, rancher from Ledor, Idaho, and uh, also a community leader in, in his part of the landscape. Uh, been involved for years in teaching and coaching and, 
and now leading conservation efforts and, and uh, Yvonne leads the Centennial Valley Association. Merrill's very involved in the uh, uh, Central Idaho Rangeland Network. Kristen Troy, uh, Executive Director of the Lemhi Regional Land Trust, community leader in Salmon, Idaho on the hospital board and very engaged in her, her and her husband own a, a, a rafting business as well, so involved on the recreation side. And finally, Rob Cavallaro, uh, he's a habitat director for Region 6 of the Idaho Department of Fish and Game based in Idaho Falls, and Rob's been very involved in all aspects of wild, wildlife conservation for years, formerly with the, uh, a land trust, and so has a, a, a great background there. So. I wanted to start out with the panel, and I, I want to start out with Yvonne. Uh, you're, you're part of a, a generation, generational family of, of ranchers in the High Divide. You're, her son's on our, collabor our coordinating committee. You're, you're talking about the next generation. What, what's special about the High Divide for you, Yvonne? This film, you know, they didn't really want a gray-haired old lady. They wanted someone young and cute, and so <laughs> they sent my my daughter was going to do it, and she's in her was in her early 30s, and and it was too emotional. She couldn't couldn't do it. You know, they asked her questions, and it and it's it's just where we're at, and what we do, and what we take care of. You know, it's. Uh, we have to make a living at it, and it's not always easy, and, and some of the choices are not, not what um, everyone likes, but it's, it's just what we do and where we're at. And it's just, you know, it, if you've been to the Centennial, why you uh, appreciate, and you know, the ranch buildings that you saw, those aren't at, in the Centennial, those are by Dell, um, but uh, it's, it's just a place that grabs you and where we want to be. So I don't know what, what else to say, but you know, so I, I tell people that have come in to save us um, that if it wasn't, f wasn't for what we'd already done, they wouldn't have anything left to save. You know, community-wise, rancher-wise, just the whole, whole culture. Thank you, Yvonne. Merrill, another generational ranching family. What's your story for the High Divide? Why do you value that landscape? Uh, well, thank you. Uh, I, I have to tell you just a little story. And so <laughs> I, I grew up on the, uh, well, I started my life on the Idaho-Wyoming border and uh, in a place called Sage Valley. And uh, that's where I, I just learned to love to roam and to do those things. I didn't do very well in school right at first because I spent all my time looking out the window and thinking that's where I should be. And, and eventually, uh, my folks decided that uh, we ought to become farmers, and so we moved to Roberts, Idaho. And I remember coming out of Star Valley, and it was just about dark, and we got down to where now Palisades is. And they were in, they were in the construction phase and my grandfather said well there's going to be a dam here and then it got dark and we got to Roberts Idaho and the next morning I got up and I thought I just can't wait to go out and see what kind of streams and mountains and hills and all the things that I would love to go and explore I stepped out of my door and looked around and it was entirely flat I had never seen flat ground and I had this distinct impression that I had died and gone to Hades. <laughs> and, and for a number of years, uh, well, for a few years, and then my folks uh, found this little place in uh, Lettor, Idaho. And I remember coming out of uh, Rigby and Manan and heading west, and uh, eventually we came over Gilmore Summit. And... Uh, when I came, when we came over Gilmore Summit and into the Lemhi Valley, uh, it was coming home. 
and it's a place I have never wanted to leave. Uh, yeah, there's something about open space. Yvette? Oh, yeah. Federal partner. Yeah, every time I hear it, <laughs> I'm off the cliff, and I'm, because you know what, actually, I, I, I haven't lived there. I grew up in Pennsylvania, north central Pennsylvania, came out west as a young adult, and uh, one of your questions that you posed to us earlier to kind of ponder is, what's our dream for the high divide? And I came out and um, from Denver, flew to Denver, flew into Jackson Hole, and was like, I discovered the place, like what, where, you know, it was mine, and um, and the West felt like home to me. And every time I watch you speak, both of you about this, it's just like, I know that feeling, even though I've only been there for 20 years, 20, 30 years. But um, so my dream for the High Divide is that iconic sense of place and the the wildlife that is nowhere else on our in our in our country as a federal land manager. That's what, what I feel like I'm, I would like to see in the dream and in my job and, and making sure I do my job. And so we, so we share so much of that when we talk about it. Um, but it is really special. Kristen's turn. What's your dream for the High Divide? <laughs> that was a big question. <laughs> you know, that, that's a big thing to, po uh, to propose. Uh, a dream came true when we actually made it here tonight, though, <laughs> because we're actually used to traveling in that landscape, and tonight we drove in the dark and the rain and a sea of traffic. <laughs> Rob, Rob uh, was our brave uh, taxi driver. Um, you know, for me, so I grew up in Salmon, and when I was thinking about this question, it's really hard for me to answer that without like looking through a lens of some context. So as you saw on the screen, you know, these places that we live, they're just these huge open landscapes. Um, but to put some numbers to it, 92% of the county that I grew up in is public land. And if you do the simple math, <laughs> that's 8% of our landscape is private land. And, you know, people get pretty worked up in our landscape about, you know, private property rights. But when you really think about what I just said, why wouldn't we get worked up about it? We don't own that much of it. And what we do own is the really important lifeblood of the landscape. I always describe it, if I can't show it in pictures, but we saw it, uh, you know, up on the screen, I describe it often as linear. You know, it's all the tributaries, it's all the river bottoms. It's so disproportionately important to the whole. But when I was thinking about this, I'm also thinking about it through the lens of, I grew up with a dad who was a hunting outfitter and really struggled, you know, to make ends meet. I said I would never, ever, never, ever, never be an outfitter. We've been outfitters for 18 years now. <laughs> yeah, the, the guide in the movie, is 76 years old and he's been guiding with us he's been guiding with my husband for probably 35 years he's been guiding with our company for about uh, 20. so for me it's you know i'm just kind of giving some context you know of the lens i graduated from high school in 1989 we went back in 2000. growing up there were big logging trucks rumbling through the community and we had a, a mine that was up and going you know it's a natural resource based economy that's what we grew up in. When you have 92% public land, what else are you going to have? You know, we are a natural resource-based place. And so it's really important to all of us that we have to have healthy natural landscapes to have vibrant communities. You simply cannot have one without the other. It has to include both. And so that's huge for me in terms of what the dream is but it's also more than that I, I think it's part of like what we're doing tonight and it's it's really cool that you know Michael brought us here because it's also about our perceptions of each other uh, perceptions that that elected officials and important decision makers have of us as you know ranchers and people that are doing nonprofits it's also about our perceptions of them you know, and the kinds of decisions that they're, that they're making for us. 
I think we need to really work at, my dream is we need to work at understanding each other a lot better. When you live in a small community like ours, my, so it was Gina on the screen, not me. She's my best friend in Salmon. We look a lot alike. Uh, but she and I often talk about, um, you know, we're still neighborly. And, and I think, you know, the, the, the big dream for me is that, is that we focus on those things and on the things that we agree on. Because I think in the end, if I had to put a word to it, because I was really trying to think about this, like what is the big dream, you know, outside of like healthy landscapes, healthy communities, we need to find a way to create durable solutions in a way that's inclusive, that provides people like us who live in that landscape some predictability. Because I, I feel like the thing that we really struggle with is not having that predictability. Whether it's how many cattle, you know, you guys can run on the landscape, how many user days we can have on the river. Like, you know, what that impact is. We're constantly struggling with that. And I feel like a few times we've all felt as operators maybe that the rug got pulled out from under us a couple of times. So. I think the dream for me is a way to get to that place and in a way that um, is inclusive of a lot of voices because it turns out uh, we're pretty okay with that, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, we're okay with inclusiveness. So I think that's what I would say. I think our mic died, but if we can get it going again, get Rob going. Do these other mics work? <laughs> I think this one works. <laughs> Does that work? Yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I guess what I love about the high divide is the wildness. Um, <clears throat> like a lot of you, I think I, I'm very uh, inspired by wild, wildlife and, and wild places and just wildness and, uh, you know, <clears throat> And, and one of the things that inspires me about the, the High Divide partnership is how high they've set the bar on wildness. And it's not just, well, we want some fish and we want some wildlife. It's we want anadromous fish uh, coming up the Columbia and spawning on the Lemhi. How, how high of a bar is that? <laughs> we want grizzly bears uh, interacting in a reasonable way with private uh, landowners, ranchers especially. We, we're going to work to try to maintain wolves on the landscape. We're going to try to maintain Yellowstone cutthroat trout, our native uh, salmonid in the Upper Snake region. And those are going to be, all, all those things are going to be tall orders. And if there's a place where that can happen, it's the high divide. And so, um, and I totally agree with uh, the speakers before me who have reiterated the importance of uh, that cultural legacy with ecological linkage. We're not going to have any of those things unless we help maintain the cultural legacy on those low elevation private lands and ranch lands. Uh, all of us here, whether we're from uh, NGOs or agencies, are dependent on enterprise. I'm a state uh, fish and game person. And without enterprise, I wouldn't have a job, and neither would any of us. And so the challenge is balancing enterprise. It's always going to be balancing enterprise with, you know, conservation. And in my mind, in my experience, and this is not how I always have felt, but uh, in the high divide especially, you know, there's no better enterprise to maintain some of that high bar than ranching, in my mind. And it's about the relationship. It's about finding balance. And it's, I, you know, what I'm learning is that's very doable. And so <clears throat> another thing I love about the High Divide is the legacy it's provided my, my kids. I have two kids, and they're both teenagers now. And uh, <clears throat> my daughter, Anna, is 19 years old. She's at her first year of college in Whitman. And uh, for the last five years, I've had to hear nothing about there's nothing to do around here. That's what I heard. This place is boring. <laughs> I don't want to go hiking again all those kind of things and now you know there's not a day that goes by without she's texting me wondering if uh, what the snowpack's like on Targi Pass or 
you know, uh, did you see any grizzly bears this summer? And uh, did you get an elk yet? And uh, back and forth about, you know, something we've seen. And it's amazing to me the connection that, even against her will, <laughs> sometimes, that she has with this landscape. And uh, it's the same with my son, who's 17, and he's, he mostly uh, sleeps. But when he's awake, <laughs> <laughs> he's he's developing that same connection, and uh, I, I'm very lucky to have lived in a place where that is is going on and transpiring. So, I'll leave it at that for now. Well, that's a good segue, uh, Yvonne and and Merrill. You you're you're passing your ranches on to the next generation, hoping to keep it in the family. What are the big challenges uh, that you face to sustain ranching in this landscape? As, as Rob has mentioned, it's really, those working lands are really vital to the sustainability of the whole system. What's the challenge for ranching? And I'll say, you know, uh, credit to these folks. They, they were a little punch drunk. They were, we had Yvonne and Merrill going to their congressional delegations Idaho and Montana all day, and then got them on the road and got them stuck in D.C. traffic for three hours, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so I got to tell you, well, and then I'll talk a little bit, but uh, so Sunday night or morning, I'm not sure which it was, about 11.30, I, I thought, well, I think it's time to get ready to head to the airport. And uh, so I left Lador and I drove 14 miles, and I passed a truck. And, uh, and then I thought, and so that got me thinking, you know, one time, so we're talking about the high divide. So one time I had gone north out of Lador, I had to catch a plane, I think it was in Butte or Billings or someplace over there. And uh, so we left Lador, and I, we drove 90 miles, and we passed an outfit. And so I thought, I wonder if I can break the record. <laughs> so we headed south on the, uh, uh, you know, head, heading south through the High Divide. And uh, I drove 83 more miles and passed another outfit. And what was the word that you used? No sniveling. <laughs> no, no sniveling. <laughs> So th that was the word that we were going to see who could use first uh, tonight. And so I sniveled just a little bit, thinking that I had missed the opportunity to break the record of 90 miles. And uh, so I felt real comfortable when I got here in D.C. and traveled out here, right at home, kind of. <laughs> uh, so, you know, when we start talking about uh, the challenges that, that we face uh, uh, to make sure that... Uh, this opportunity remains for our children, for our grandchildren, and I can literally speak to that. For our children, uh, my three sons uh, found girls that uh, decided that maybe living uh, two hours from a McDonald's wasn't so bad. And so they came and became part of our ranch, and their grandchildren, or my grandchildren now, uh, are part of, part of the deal. And you know, uh, some of the things I think that we face are, are no different than other folks. Uh, one of the things that we continually worry about is uh, a school. And if you're in rural, uh, isolated communities, the school becomes the heart of the community. That's where we all go and meet and talk and do all those things. And uh, we faced a period of time when the numbers in our schools just uh, spiraled downward. If you go into the rural parts of Idaho, and I suspect in other places, our population of our schools are probably half of what they were a decade or two decades ago. And uh, so when I think about the high divide, one of the things that just makes me smile, one person said, and I think it's true, first we got the fish, and then we got our children. And uh, the work we've been able to do on the high divide, the collaborative work, all the partnerships and those things have pre created opportunities, and so now our children are returning. Uh, there are other things that we, you know, we, we look at. Uh, 
And I don't see those as quite as big challenges. Uh, we look at our, our public lands and the opportunity uh, to access those, and we graze on them. You know, that's, that's what we do as ranchers. Uh, but I do look at another deal, and that's if we look at it, and I think Michael alluded to that, when we look at the growth that is going to occur, and that's coming. There's not much we're going to do about that. But we're going to need to be smart and thoughtful how we handle that growth to make sure that those most important places are protected, maintained. Uh, we need health care. Uh, we need infrastructure. We need to be able to communicate. All those things are necessary if we're going to maintain an economy in this landscape and to be able to pass that on to our, our children. And I think too often when we look at all that, we think uh, it's publico pro bono, free to the public. But you know, to maintain that and to make sure it remains for generations to come, I think we're going to have to begin to consider the investment that we are going to have to make as an entire public to make sure these remain. He did an excellent job on that. And um, we have, you know, same issues. Our school is currently has less than 60 students in it, K through 12. Um, scary thought. That's half of what it was uh, 20 years ago. Where, where our children and grandchildren go, you know, that's where we go. Um, if we don't have a school in our community, then, and the children move out, and so then you're splitting up families, and then who wants to work in that environment? Who wants to be there full time? So then who's gonna take care of that resource? Um, one of, that's one of the things that, you know, we talked about today with our uh, congressional delegates is those funds that are necessary to support those schools and roads and counties and hospitals, the whole whole work of things. And we also talked about when we're working together, we need people in our agencies that are part of our communities. If, if somebody's there and they're moving on every two or three years, then there's no trust built with those people and so it's really tough to get the ranchers um, to work together with them because they don't know them and the people often don't know the community and the landscape as well as they think they do. You know, I have a couple little grandsons that um, last year went, their folks took them skiing and the one who was six years old and he said, I said, you know, so you're gonna take a lesson? Yeah, I don't need a lesson. I know how to ski. Have you ever been skiing? Well, no, but you know, I know it all. And we get people that sometimes come down and know it all, even though they've never been out really and, and experienced anything. So we have to give them that opportunity to stay someplace long enough to experience what the community they're in is like. Um, challenges, the population, increase that's predicted to be coming we're seeing you know a huge change in the traffic patterns in the centennial there's you know and there's no resources there you there's no gas there's no girl no grocery store no restaurant um, people just come in and go through but but they leave a, a footprint oftentimes and we follow along and pick up the garbage that maybe they leave behind. Most of them are pretty good, but um, somebody has to be responsible for taking care of that resource. The bears and the wolves, um, we have a little range rider program and uh, it doesn't encompass the whole, the centennial is about 485,000 acres. And, and I doubt that the range rider is really on a consistent basis. You know, they put cameras out and uh, cover 
75,000 acres of it in a very sporadic uh, way. And they identified 18 different grizzly bears in it this summer. I, I don't think that um, we had some losses, but they were never verified. And, and this was probably the best year we ever had. We're making different management decisions on how mm -hmm. we're running our cattle. This year we weaned a month early. Um, last year we had a confirmed, we had a, a calf that was bitten on the back and you know, if we'd shot him, we would have got compensation, but instead we foolishly took him home and doctored him for two months and healed him up. Because um, that's what we do, we take care of our animals and, and we like, you know, we like the wildlife, but there has to be a balance and on this predations and, and so we lost one heifer for sure last year, but we were short others. The year before we were short, we were missing just, not just dead, but just unconfirmed animals. They just were nowhere to be found, 18 calves. Three years before that we had 40 that were missing. And I think that previous year I, the prices were good and I think maybe there were two-legged pre predators on some of those. You know, so we want to put the blame where it belongs, but um, there was no compensation, so we have to figure out how to balance that out. If you lose some places, you know, if you lose one, did you lose two and a half? I mean, what's what's the balance? So that's that's something that is a concern for our community, um, and the and the population growth that's going to drive up land prices. So how does that affect when I die the uh, value of my interest in that ranch? Raises the property values because that's, you know, that's when things are considered. So we have to consider um, the taxes if there's still a, a death tax. You know, we paid for that ground once, so do we pay for it again? Just, just lots of little things. We, we think right now that we have it figured out to pass it on to our son and, and one daughter, or their families. And, but then there's the other daughter. Uh, how is she treated? You know, fair and equal aren't always the same. So it's just families have to agree on those things. And so there's, you know, it sounds like, you know, we were talking about retirement and and things and and hobbies and you know a lot of ranchers I was thinking are like the salmon at least my husband is you know he, he uh, works and takes care of this ground and and uh, goes goes and goes and goes and when he dies that's because where he's at because that's where he wants to be he's still taking care of the ground Thank you. Uh, Yvette, we talk about community-based conservation, and, and you work with an effort that's really, really huge in terms of the, the Great Northern, the, the landscape you work with. What's the benefit of that community-based conservation to landscape conservation? And for those of you that don't know, I have met these folks before and have talked with a few of them, but I don't work as closely with them. I'm actually kind of filling in for the local Forest Service person who couldn't make it. Um, so I represent Fish and Wildlife Service or a perspective from the federal government. Um, I've been in this position as an LCC coordinator for eight years. And uh, before that, I had an aquatics background working in ES, working in a fish research facility. and. Um, working with a lot of partnership programs. So what I've learned coming to this is, uh, and I really came into it because of my background working with partnerships. And uh, what I've learned is that um, to really be effective uh, at, at convening, at creating a regional context for the work we do locally, the action happens locally, but creating that regional context, you have to empower the local communities, the local people and the leaders to do that work. Um, so that's how we've, run our LCC. It's really about empowering this network that feeds the local communities to, to do the work and lead the work 
and decide how they're most relevant in that larger context. And we help to provide that context and we help to provide that capacity, which is part of what's missing in all our programs. The capacity, meaning the money to pay somebody or to have somebody be able to travel to meet and sit down and spend the time and to, have, to be able to figure out ways to share the information and spend the time doing that where our mandates as agencies or in organizations don't allow us to do that. Um, so that's what I think is what I've learned in the last eight years, and I think that's a critical piece that I, I don't want us to miss as we start to learn lessons about collaborative conservation. Um, you know, we didn't come at this as managing, you know, sort of a bunch of uh, uh, partnerships on the ground. We came at it as there's a larger context, and can we bring partners to the table and let them inform what their relevance is to that larger context? Meryl, in the, in the film, you talked about creating this safe place for people to change perspective. Can you describe that a little bit, what that means, how you get there? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, well, we talked about this today a little bit uh, when we were on the Hill. We talked about uh, uh, trust and, you know, how, how do you create trust within a community? Uh, so there are a couple things that come to my mind. Uh, we, we wean calves about, uh, well, maybe a, a month and a half ago. And uh, that's always kind of an interesting time on the ranch, I can tell you that. Uh, there's a lot of bawling, and we try to do it the very best way we can. We do it through the fence, and the first day, you know, those calves are right along the fence line. They don't want to leave mom at all. And so we don't do anything that very first day. We just let them be right along the fence line. They can look across and the cow can look back across. Uh, but on day two, you're gonna see those calves kind of starting to move out a little bit away from their, from their mother. And this is a real critical time on a ranch. Uh, this is a time that you better get out and walk and just stand among those calves. You want to do that for the next three or four days. And you know, when you do that, they begin to identify you as not a threat, but as someone they can walk up to and actually smell and sniff and do those kind of things. And so you, be a, you build a trust in them, or they build a trust in you. And uh, when you have to ask them to do things uh, later on, it becomes a lot easier. And so I think that's kind of exactly the same thing that you have to do. First of all, you have to cre create that proximity. And I remember when I first became involved kind of in this, in this kind of a way, uh, uh, the, the very first person that ever created proximity for me was a fish and game person by the name of Tom Curette. And he came into our driveway and I still remember it very distinctly in my mind. It was in the middle of July, we were haying, and I was under the swather in the driveway. Not a good time for anybody to come and visit a rancher. And so I remember him pulling in the yard, and I was under it, and I knew it was a pickup, and I looked out, and I saw the insignia of the fish and game. And the first thought that came to my mind was, I don't think I've done anything illegal today. <laughs> uh, so he was sort of, sort of like me and the calves, you know. Uh, he just came and we began to talk and spend some time and it created a, a great relationship. Uh, the second thing that I think is, is really, really important, you're never going to create trust you're never going to be able to create a working relationship if uh, you're not trustable. Uh, if you come with an agenda, if you're not willing to listen, if you're not willing to open your mind and look at different ideas and respect those with different ideas. And so, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I think we just happen to get the right people, and Kristen and all these others that are here with me. 
uh, were the right people in the right place at the right time. And once trust is created, then the work begins. And the more trust that you have, the faster the work, the more you get done. And uh, that's it. I'm going to ask Kristen and Rob for one last question, and then maybe we can open it up or, or, uh, or let these folks rest. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen, uh, you suggested that rural people, particularly in a landscape like yours, 8% private land, that, that they really understand the value of inter interconnectedness. Uh, so why do we need an all lands, all hands kind of an approach to conservation in this landscape? Well, I feel like it's kind of a funny question. Aren't you all here talking about large landscape <laughs> conservation? I mean, I, I definitely, uh, you know, respect the audience here. I, I know that's what you're here talking about. But in our landscape, when I think about that, you know, we've often said, Merrill and I always say, we really don't see fence lines in our landscape as being meaningful because they're often not that meaningful. I mean, they could be on public, they could be on private. And we, we already kind of touched on the fact that, that you know, those, the private lands are, can be so disproportionately important, but it's also important to imagine, like on Merrill's Ranch, for instance, um, that I'm pretty familiar with, and 99% and of the ranches in our landscape run on public grazing allotments. And in terms of acreage, I would say a lot of them make up at least, uh, the public acreage makes up about, what, two-thirds? of the ranch in some cases? Maybe more. Maybe more. You know, maybe three-fourths. Maybe. Well, a lot. <laughs> in other words. <laughs> so, so, you know, you have, you have those kinds of examples. The uh, Chinook spawning, you know, we saw such great footage in the film. Up to 90% of the most critical habitat for our Chinook salmon that swim 850 to 900 miles inland are found on private land. You know, critical winter habitat, you guys know this, they all come down on private land. There just has to be, you know, that interconnection. You can't have one without the other. And we talk about all lands, you know, the public and the private, but also all hands. And, and that's also been alluded to in terms of the, you know, the inclusivity with how uh, we get our work done. And for us in our landscape, um, it has the Chinook salmon have been that. Uh, might have been you that used the word connective tissue. Somebody did at one of our, uh, one of our meetings a while ago. But they really have been the connective tissue in our community to help us bridge those gaps and really, really think about that. And of course, there's plenty of other species that do that as well. Um, but it's critical. I don't think that we can do this any other way. We don't approach it like that. Well, the question I wanted to pose to you, Rob, and, and you're, you talked about wildness and wildlife. Those, those are what drive uh, a lot of your values. Uh, and we've, we've talked about you know, coming together and singing Kumbaya together. Can we really, can we really uh, get meaningful conservation when we're engaging all these array of perspectives and, and trying to find that common ground, does that lead us to a good outcome? And you've talked about that high bar, that's what we're shooting for. Sure. Um, I think it's the only way to get there. Um, as, as a fishing game uh, person, one of the things I, I, I've been with Idaho Fishing Game for 10 years, and one of the things that I've learned is um, that a lot of what you do is reactive. You're reacting to the public who is, in, in many cases, in a state of conflict with wildlife, whether it's suburbanites who have skunk in the crawl, a skunk in the crawl fates, or bats in the attic, or, I mean, daily these, these calls come in. And some of the most crucial and important conflicts are with you know, large landowners who are trying to make a living on, on their lands, particularly in the winter when elk are in the stackyards or uh, in the feed, feed lines with the cows or, you know, that's a real, that's a real issue that has to be solved um, for that enterprise and for us to get along. And, and, you know, in some cases, literally, grizzly, we've had grizzly bears on somebody's porch 
And so when that happens, you go out and you deal with that. And you're often in a reactive or even an adversarial relationship with landowners because of that. Because they're your, at that point, they're your wildlife. It's just like when your wife says, that's your son. Get your son out of here. <laughs> uh, when something happens bad with wildlife, that becomes our wildlife. And uh, get your grizzly off my porch, <laughs> which I understand that one. And, uh, but, you know, what, what has been really interesting about the, you know, uh, conservation collaboratives that I've been involved in is, you know, it, ch it helps change that relationship um, from reactive and adversarial to more collaborative. You know, it, it provides a, a table, you know, just like you say, a safe place where you can sit down and say, all right, uh, I didn't like the way this guy handled the elk in my stack yard, but I, you know, see his point on this issue, and I think I can work with him and, and grow from there. And if we as an agency are only reacting to problems with elk and grizzly bears or whatever, then we're not really getting anywhere. And so, you know, an example of I think where we're successful because of this group, because of the partnership brought together was actually a grizzly bear conflict in the Island Park area, east, right outside of Yellowstone National Park. Uh, over a several year period, we had a landowner who, uh, you know, had his land, you know, um, you know multi-generation family land, and he was not, uh, his family were no longer ranchers. He's a, actually a pharmacist, and he just goes out there, and he, he needed the lease uh, agreement with a, another uh, rancher that had some cows to help with his tax situation. And so the cows were important for him, uh, uh, both from a legacy standpoint and also from a tax, you know, helping to pay the bills. And there's a wetland on this property, a, a rare wetland where there's mires out there essentially, and cows were getting mired in this wetland, and grizzlies were coming in and just picking them off. And he lost multiple cows every year and we documented four different bears on this property it was only 300 acres uh, but it's in a pretty wild wild place and this guy was extremely tolerant extremely patient but he wanted some help and he would not come to fish and game he didn't trust fish and game and so we got wind of this issue pretty quickly and and so we went to one of our partners at the nature conservancy david westcamp and said you know we really want to uh, we really want to work with this guy. Can you uh, provide an entree for us or go talk to him? And he was, he's very talented with that sort of thing. And he went in and, and sat down and had a few conversations. At one, at one point, they invited me to the table. And we started to build trust and, and then developed a solution. And we, you know, without going into a lot of detail, I, we came up with a solution to really address that. And uh, we haven't, didn't have any grizzly uh, mortality or cattle mortalities from grizzly this year. Uh, we've got that, you know, I've got that landowner calling me and checking in with me on things. He wrote an article thanking us for, his, for the help, you know, raising the funds and working. And so that's the way it's got to happen or it's not going to happen. And, you know, if you think about, you know, a, a critter like a grizzly bear and asking people to tolerate that, you know, you, <laughs> that's a big ask, and when that's on your property. And so you've got to be there, and you've got to have that relationship beyond just reacting to the phone call. And so it's, it's crucial. That's the, you know, that's the way we maintain that high bar. It's not just about uh, maintaining those high elevation public lands, which, you know, I've also learned in our country not to take those for granted either. I mean, there's continuing threats and demands on those lands. But I think really for the, for the high bar, uh, maintaining that high bar for cutthroat and grizzly bears and anadromous fish, it's, it's gonna be about working collaboratively with private landowners and partners. Sure.
Can you share the mic there? Is it still working? Trust is a big word. If you have somebody from, from an organization that comes in and screws somebody in your community, then the trust goes out the door. So keep it in mind, because it one bad apple spoils all the work that everybody else is doing. So that trust is, is to me, one of the biggest words there is. We've, you know, we've sold livestock for years without contracts. Now most of the time, you know, if video auctions, whatever, you have a contract. Maybe it doesn't get signed till after the sale because, you know, the rep doesn't want to drive the other 100 miles to do it, and we said we'd sign it. But trust, trust is just, to me, the big, one of the biggest things that's out there. Any other closing thoughts? <laughs> I know Meryl's pondering. <laughs> well, you know, um, Kristen talked about uh, the, the kind of makeup of our landscape. About 8% 8, 8 of it is private lands, and 92% of it is public lands. And so uh, the question that she was uh, answering was, you know, what's that relationship as far as a rancher? And so on our ranch, uh, we have about 4,800 acres of uh, private land, and uh, we run on about 40,000 acres of public lands. And so that's about a 10 to 1 deal. And uh, there's, there's one thing that I've always thought is uh, if we want to remain viable as a ranching operation, we darn sure need to make sure that our attention is on those public lands that those public lands, as far as our interaction with them, uh, is always a positive deal. And uh, so then I think, from the other side of the coin, if you really value and treasure these public lands, the, the gift that, that we've been given as a people, I think darn sure you need to focus on the private lands. If we lose those private lands, we really lose the public lands. And if we lose the public lands, we as ranchers and, and the folks that live in this part of the world really lose everything.